from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Ann McLean from the Library's Music Division. Tonight's book talk is part of the Concerts from the Library of Congress series, and we have a wonderful lineup for your, this season. And I wanted to say that I know there are patrons here from New York, New Jersey, San Francisco, uh, and several other places, that, and I wanted to especially welcome them. I'm so grateful that you guys have come for such a long way, from such a long way. Um, for people who are new tonight, please take a look at our brochure. We have some wonderful offerings coming up. Uh, including a concert with McCoy Tyner and Joe Lovano in December. This evening, it's a great pleasure for us to present reggae historian Roger Steffens, talking about his book, So Much Things to Say, The Oral History of Bob Marley. We're delighted to be able to present such an authoritative speaker. He's devoted a lifetime's passionate interest and research to this iconic figure in the musical and cultural history of our time. One of several Steffens volumes on Marley and on the history of reggae, this remarkable book chronicles a 40-year witness to Marley's life and music. It's informed by impeccable scholarship. Critics have described it as revelatory, myth-shattering, and magisterial. Some of you may know that Mr. Steffens is a collector as well as a noted scholar. He has amassed a monumental archive of Marley recordings, artifacts, and memorabilia, the world's largest. So we feel we have a unique resource here. Roger Steffens' bio includes expertise in an impressive list of wide-ranging careers, author, actor, lecturer, radio host of the long-running reggae beat show, journalist, photographer, and producer. He was not only an eyewitness to performances by the Whalers, but a tour participant in the 1970s. Bruno Blum has commented that so much things to say is about, quote, identity, culture, pride, spirituality. And he says that, like Marley's music, quote, it helps us understand who we really are. This is the power of a great musician. And I wanted to say in introducing Roger that the Whalers' pivotal 1973 album, Burnin, was named to the Library of Congress National Recording Registry in 2007, a distinguished gesture marking recordings of cultural, historic, and artistic importance to American society. And now please join me in welcoming Roger Steffens. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you very much, Ann. I'm just so thrilled to be here. Marley in the Library of Congress, who would have thought? So the format for this evening is, um, I'm going to explain a little bit about how this white guy from Brooklyn got so involved in the culture and history of Jamaica and the life of the prophet of reggae, and uh, talk about how this book was born and the reason behind it, and uh, trace some of the myth-busting portions of the book. And after that, we will have questions and answers. So be thinking about what you might like to know that I might be able to answer. Um, I first heard reggae in 1973. I discovered it because of an article in Rolling Stone magazine by an Australian gonzo journalist named Michael Thomas, who wrote, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of Upper Niger consciousness. <laughs> I said, I don't know what that means, but I got to find it right now. And I went out immediately. I was living in Berkeley, and I found a used copy of Bob's first international album, Catch a Fire, uh, the one that opened up in the middle like a Zippo lighter. And my life changed forever. And the next night, I saw The Harder They Come, the great Jamaican reggae movie by Perry Hensel, and bought the soundtrack on the way home. And for the past 44 years, my life has gone in that direction. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to meet Bob originally in 78 in Santa Cruz. And in 79, I just started a, a radio show with Hank Holmes on the NPR station in LA, KCRW, called The Reggae Beat. And we were on the air for about six weeks when Island Records called us up 
and said, would you mind going on the road with Bob Marley for a couple of weeks? <laughs> so these pictures, in fact, that one is my most famous picture. It's been bootlegged all over the world. It was the cover of the Soul Almighty album. And uh, this series of pictures were shot on uh, November 24th, 1979 in the San Diego Sports Arena dressing room when I was on the road with Bob. And, and the happiest guy for those two weeks was the bus driver. Because at the end of each evening, he got to sweep up all the roaches. <laughs> <laughs> and he said one night he went home with almost half a pound. <laughs> well, you got a busload of whalers, come on. Um, in, um, in 1980, uh, Bob did his final tour of America. And uh, that was the same year that I started a television show with a Trinidadian uh, a compatriot uh, named Chili Charles. And that television show ran for 23 years. It was called LA Reggae. And uh, Peter Tosh and Jimmy Cliff were the first guests on that show. Um, in 1981, a woman named Cece Smith and I started a magazine uh, that eventually was called simply The Beat a reggae and world beat magazine. And uh, that was the same year that the show became syndicated to 130 stations all over the world. And in 1984, I was asked to found the Reggae Grammy Committee, and I was the chairman of that for 27 years. And that was the same year I began doing a one-man show called simply The Life of Bob Marley in which I showed a couple of hours of unreleased films and told his life story in between the clips. And we've done that all over the world. Uh, we did it at the bottom of the Grand Canyon for the Havasupai Indians who believe that Bob Marley is the reincarnation of Chief Crazy Horse, returned to Earth as a black man to lead the red man forward to his freedom again. And we've done it for the Maori people in New Zealand. It's not Maori, it's Maori. It's like Marley without the L. And they called him the Redeemer when he played there in 1979. We've done it in the outback for the Aboriginal people who practically worship Bob. In the Himalayas, in Kathmandu, there is a belief that Bob Marley is a reincarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu. Um, it, it is a remarkable impact that Bob has had on, on the world. And he is recognized worldwide as a prophet. Uh, the head of Amnesty International says everywhere he goes in the world today, Bob Marley is the symbol of freedom. And I'd like to trace his life for you now in um, a very, very brief fashion uh, and, and tell you some of the high points. And, and the reason I wanted to do this book, it's my ninth, it's my seventh book about Bob and reggae, but this is the most important book. The book has interviews with 75 people who were important in Bob's life. And I didn't want to be the white guy making up conversations and telling you why you should love Bob Marley. I wanted to tell his story in the words of the people who knew him, who lived with him, who experienced him as an artist and as a philosopher and as a leader. And uh, Kwame Dawes, the great Ghanaian Jamaican poet has said that this book is a tribute to the storytelling virtuosity of the Jamaican people. And that's what I hope to do here. And, and dispel some of the consistent myths about Bob. In fact, Bob was, uh, was born on February 6th, 1945. His father was um, a white Jamaican from a very wealthy family that built a lot of the infrastructure of Jamaica and has often been misdescribed in numerous reports to the current day, in fact, as being um, a captain and um, a naval officer and a British man, all of which is absolute nonsense. And on the very first page of the book, I interview Christopher Marley from the Marley family. Uh, Marley's father was the brother of Christopher's grandfather. And uh, Marley's father was named Norval Sinclair Marley. And when Bob was born, he was 64 years of age 
Bob's mother, who was a black woman from the northern part of Jamaica in a little remote village called Nine Mile, was 18 years old. So basically, he was a dirty old man. <laughs> and he was disowned by, by his own family. They wanted nothing to do with him. So this is how the book starts. Christopher Marley says, Bob Marley's father was Norval Sinclair Marley, born to a British father and a colored mother. Norval was not a sea captain, nor was he a quartermaster or captain or officer in the British Army. He was a ferro-cement engineer. He poured cement. His British Army discharge papers show that he worked in various labor corps in the UK during the First World War and was discharged as a private. He did not see active service on the battlefield. Norval Marley's family was not Syrian, as has been suggested. He was a restless, wandering man. He traveled and worked all over the world at a time when travel was not the simple thing that it is today, to Cuba, the UK, Nigeria. And one night he went out for cigarettes and came back six months later and said he'd been in Cape Town. He was supervising this subdivision of some rural land in St. Anne Parish for war veteran housing when he married 18-year-old Sadella Malcolm, whom he had gotten pregnant. He provided little financial support and seldom, if ever, saw her and their son. He died of a heart attack in 1955, stone broke, and living off an eight shilling a week army pension, about a dollar and 20 US a week. Norval was seriously unstable, to put it mildly. The rejection of Bob by the Marley family was a rejection of Norval. So that's who Bob Marley's father really was. And when Bob was about three and a half years of age, he began evincing psychic powers. He read the hand of a woman in the village named Aunt Zen, and the hand of the local police const constable. And they both went to Bob's mother. And she told me about that. And, and she said they told her that everything Bob told them about their life was true. So keep an eye on this kid, because something's going on here. I heard so many stories of his psychic abilities as I compiled the interviews for this book. Uh, one of the most profound was from a very uh, intellectual Jamaican author named Gregory Philp, who met Bob Marley at the University of the West Indies in 1976. And Bob called him over and sat next to him and began telling him intimate details about his life, things he said that even his mother didn't know. And uh, those kinds of stories were repeated over and over as I did the research. My initial idea for this book, when I signed the contract in 2002 uh, with Norton, was to have 110 interviews that I had done over the years with people involved in Bob's life and publish the entire transcript of each of those interviews so that it would be the raw material for historians. Um, after three years of work on it, my computer died and ate everything. And I had to start all over again, doing all the transcriptions, and my notes were lost, and uh, it, it set me back for years. And, and in 2007, uh, my editor, Jim Mars, said, where's the book? And I had to tell him what happened. And he said, all right, start it again. And I got about four years into it and thought it was pretty well finished when I sent him most of the manuscript, and he said, well, we've been talking about it, and this is not the book we really want. Uh, we'd like you to uh, shorten it considerably and put the book in chronological order and take all the different voices about each of the main events in Bob's life and mix them together in that format known popularly as oral history. So I had to dismantle the whole thing and start all over again, and then my editor died. So in the world of unintentional consequences, um, something very good happened. The book was turned over to a young editor at Norton uh, named Tom Mayer. Now, I had been a disc jockey on KCRW in Los Angeles. He had been a reggae disc jockey on WKCR at Columbia University. 
And I used to promote records to him when I was the national promotions director of Island Records. And he told me that this was the book he was born to edit. And he did a complete restructuring of it. I had sent him 700 pages in nine long chapters and he turned it into 400 pages and 35 digestible, readable chapters. So I, I owe whatever success this book will have to Tom Mayer, and I want to make a, a public declaration of that. So um, we follow Bob's life through the words of people who knew him best. And in the early part of his life, uh, he met at the age of 11 uh, a young fellow and his father who had came, come to Nine Mile from Kingston, uh, Toddy Livingston and his son, Bunny. And Toddy fell in love with Bob's mother and moved him, uh, Bob, and his mother to Kingston. And Bob lived in Toddy's house for a long time. He was treated poorly as an outside kid. In fact, he slept underneath the house on the ground. And at 14, he quit school. He said, I don't need any more schooling. I've learned everything they can teach me. And uh, from now on, I'm going to be a singer. Well, his mother said, you know, get yourself a trade first, and then you can be a singer. So she sent him to work in a welding shop. And he had an accident and almost lost his eye and spent a couple of weeks in the hospital recovering from that. And she said, OK, you can be a singer. One of the real heroes in the book and one of my dearest friends was Joe Higgs, the, known as the father of reggae music. And Joe Higgs was paid by an East Indian man named Errol to tutor Bob Marley. And for years, he studied with Joe and learned the basics of vocal technique, stagecraft, composition. He played a lot of jazz for Bob and uh, readied him for a professional career. And in 1963, Bob decided he was ready to record, even though Joe didn't feel that way. And he went to the studio of a man named Leslie Kong. Leslie Kong was um, a fellow who owned a, a candy store and had a studio up in the attic. And Bob auditioned for him with a song he had written called Judge Not, which was a very mature lyric for a, a teenager. Uh, the road of life is rocky and you may stumble too, and while you point the finger, someone else is judging you, so judge not before you judge yourself. And that's typical of what Bob did throughout his life because that lyric got recycled uh, 16 years later as part of Could You Be Loved, only now it was the I-3, the women singing behind him. And the, the record flopped. He followed it with a country and western cover called uh, One Cup of Coffee. That flopped. And he went back and he began to sing with several other people, including Bunny, who was raised as his brother, and a new fellow who had just shown up in Kingston named Peter Tosh. And uh, they also had a man in the group who was uh, very young but had an incredible voice named Junior Braithwaite. And everybody agreed that he had the best voice in the group. And there were two women who rehearsed with the Whalers, uh, especially Cherry Green, but she had a child and a job and couldn't come to the first recording session when the Whalers auditioned for Cox and Dodd at his Studio One in Jamaica. And so the night before the first recording session, they got a woman who had been singing in a local uh, talent contest named Beverly Kelso. And she became a Whaler. And the next morning, according to several people, they went to Studio One and recorded Simmer Down, the Whalers' first record. Um, there are several conflicting reports in the book from people who were in the same room at the same time saying it was the, the night of the audition, it was the next morning, it was two weeks later. So as I say, this is the raw material of history and it's up to the historians to try to make sense of some of these things. Regardless, the song came out, sold a remarkable 80,000 copies and became a number one hit. And from that point forward, for the next two years, the Whalers were never off the charts in Jamaica. They had, at one point, five of the top ten songs, and they began to be called the Jamaican Beatles. In early 1966, Bob married a woman whose group he'd been coaching, the Solettes, a woman named Rita Anderson. 
And depending on who you talk to, the next day or several months later, Bob moved to America to join his mother, who had married a man in Delaware in 1962. And while in Delaware, he swept floors in the DuPont Hotel and worked on the assembly line uh, on a forklift in the Chrysler plant yeah, up in uh, Delaware. And the Army came calling for him, asking him to register for the draft, and he decided he didn't want to do that and returned immediately to Jamaica. In the aftermath of his departure, Haile Selassie, the god of the Rastafarian faith, came to Jamaica. And Rita and her cousin Vision Walker, who had replaced Bob briefly in the Whalers after he had come to Delaware, saw him. And as he passed by, uh, he, Selassie waved at them, and they both swear they saw the stigmata of Christ in his palm. And they told Bob about this, and Bob began to, as they say in Jamaica, cite Rastafari. And to him, his entire life was a livication, not a dedication, because Rasta does not deal with death in any form. So no dedication, it's a livication, to spreading the message of the one true and living God incarnate as a man in our lifetimes. And everything else took second place to that. This was his purpose on earth. Um, the Whalers were an incredibly successful group. And one of the most interesting passages in the book comes from a man who was also working at Studio One in the mid-60s with the Whalers named Bob Andy. And on his website, he had a beautiful story that he allowed me to include in the book. And I, I want to read that to you now. Bob Andy said, there was a room at Studio One where we used to listen to records. Coxon would give artists music to listen to on this turntable and speakers, but there was another room between Coxon's inner office and the music room where you could go and lock yourself in and no one else could enter. The Whalers had access to that, and I did too. One particular day, I was the witness to a very special performance. It was like being let into a secret. I was very high from smoking, and they were always high too. It was the first time I had seen each of the whalers with a guitar. And each time I remember this, it's like remembering a dream. I sat there, and they were just messing around with various songs for a while, but finally it climaxed with a song called Ten to One which I later found out was a Curtis Mayfield song. Bob sang the first line, then Bunny came in on the second, and all three came in on the next line. Peter sang a line, and then all three sang in harmony. Then Bob and Bunny sang solo again. When they started that song, I saw a side of the Wailers that I felt no one else had ever seen. It was like my own personal revelation. I've never heard music so beautiful, and I've never seen such love and camaraderie in all my life. I knew then that the Whalers were special people, but they were special by being the Whalers as a unit. When I reflect on that occasion, it was divine. It was like being on a spaceship listening to the music of the spheres. I was spellbound. And that memory will stay with me forever. So not only were normal people moved by the whalers, but their fellow professionals were too. And one of the people who discovered Bob on an international basis was Johnny Nash. Remember, I can see clearly now. And he and his business partner, a man named Danny Sims, discovered Bob on an Ethiopian Christmas day in early January 1968 at a Ground Nation, a Rastafarian gathering in Kingston. And they signed Bob and Peter and Rita, Bunny was in prison at the time for ganja, uh, to a, a contract with their label, JAD Records. And for the next four years, Bob was tutored especially by Johnny and brought to a true international status as an artist. Um, they tried to get hits with the Whalers' own recordings of the songs, but they couldn't get airplay in America or Britain 
for those songs. They sounded too strange to the ears of American disc jockeys. But Johnny Nash had several hits with Bob Marley's compositions, and that was the first time Bob made any serious money. In fact, when the Whalers recorded for Cox and Dodd, they never made more than three pounds a week, about five bucks a week. And so when Bob came back from the States at the end of 66, the Whalers started their own label called Whalen Solem, a combination of the Whalers and the Solettes. And they tried very, very hard to make enough money to follow their dream. The Whalers' dream was to have a house of their own which they could uh, live in with their families and have their own recording studios so that whatever time of the day or night the inspiration struck, they could go right into the studio. And that was what they were working toward. But they could never make enough money with their own singles to, to have that happen. And finally, in early 1970, they made an album for Leslie Kong. Leslie Kong was the man who had made Judge Not with Bob as a solo artist. And at that point, he'd had tremendous success with My Boy Lollipop and the first international reggae hit the Israelites by Desmond Decker and the Aces, sold four million copies. So they figured Leslie Kong knew how to have an international success and they went with him for one album. And it was a, a unique album in Jamaican history because it wasn't just a collection of singles, it was done intact as an album inspired by the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper and the Rolling Stones and they wanted to give themselves a pep talk to get back full time into the business. So there were songs like Go Tell It on the Mountain and Do It Twice and uh, Soul Shakedown Party with that great James Brown cop, Janie's in the backyard doing the outside dance. And they were about to release it and Leslie Kong told the Whalers he was going to call the album The Best of the Whalers. And they got very upset, especially Bunny. And here's where one of the myths turns out to be true. Um, Bunny said, look, we're young people. We have long lives and careers in front of us. So if this is the best of the whalers to you, it must mean you're not going to be around much longer. So don't do it. Well, Kong put the album out, called it the best of the whalers, and a few weeks later dropped dead in his studio. So from that point on, the word of Bunny Whaler had a little more weight to it. So finally, in desperation, they turned to the diminutive genius Lee Scratch Perry, whose goal is to hijack the earth. Um, a producer who also had a great deal of success in the late 60s, especially in England. And uh, I asked him uh, why he called himself Scratch. And he said, because all things start from scratch. So check it out, who am I? <laughs> they had a 50-50 handshake agreement that every penny they would make from their music would be divided equally between them. And Perry, after they had recorded about 28 tracks, took them to England, sold them to uh, Trojan Records, and came back with $18,000 and told the Whalers he wasn't give them, going to give them anything, that they would eventually get some royalties. And Bunny almost killed him on the spot. And they had a, a meeting a week later, and in the book, Bunny describes in great detail what happened when Bunny and Peter went to a private meeting with Lee Perry. And Lee Perry put a big bottle of yellow liquid on the desk in between them. And Peter reached for it and scratched it. Hey, hey, don't touch that, don't touch that. And they began to be suspicious. Turned out it was a bottle of the acid that they used to cut metal stampers from which records were pressed. So that was the end of their relationship with Lee Scratch Perry. And it wasn't until 1996 that they began to make any money at all from those seminal recordings, which many critics consider the greatest work of the Whalers as a trio. There are so many things I want to say, and there's such a short time to do it, so you have to read the book to get all the rest of the details about things like that, but there's, there's fascinating stuff around all of these, these facts. Um, 
In, 70, in 71, Johnny Nash took Bob Marley to Sweden in the dead of winter to help him write the soundtrack for a motion picture that he was going to star in. And um, Bob was very, very unhappy during that period. And uh, he came back and lived in London for a while. And eventually, the Whalers Band joined him there. And they began to tour colleges with Johnny Nash, who was being billed at the time as the king of reggae. Not Bob, Johnny Nash. And they brought the big bass drum, the Nyabingi drum with them. And there is an incredible story in here that Bunny tells of them being in the north of England in a theater opening for Johnny. And they come out with the big bass drum and they sing Rasta Man chant. And the audience is mesmerized and they do their set and they have this snake line going all through the theater dancing and they demand an encore, and they get the encore, and they run through their entire repertoire, and the audience wants more, and Johnny is backstage stewing, and they, they finish their set, and they, they go outside, and the audience follows them out. Most of the <laughs> audience leaves, and Johnny comes out and starts singing, and half the audience that's left leaves, and then he sings the second song, and there's about 10 people left. And finally, as he starts the third song, they leave too. And after that, the Whalers discovered Johnny Nash in the uh, back alley beating his fists against the brick wall. And according to Bunny, he never appeared again, which is not true. But um, that was the end of their relationship with, with Johnny. And uh, finally, they get introduced to Chris Blackwell who has been repressing their records in England for many years. And when they are ushered into his office in August of 1972 in London, uh, they are told by Chris Blackwell that he has paid hundreds of thousands of pounds to Cox and Dodd to license their recordings. And he said, what did you do with all that money? And they were just utterly taken aback. Remember, they were getting three pounds a week at the height. And so they, they utilized that in their music because Bob's music is basically his diary. They were always told, you know, you can never talk to the boss, to, big, to Mr. Blackwell. He's too big, you know. Um, and there are the lines in Bob's song, how many rivers do we have to cross? before we can talk to the boss. It seems that all that we got, we have lost. We must have really paid the cost. So you see, the first 10 years of the Whalers' history is a story of great promise with all these successful producers promising the world to them and then having those, all those promises dashed. So this is the situation they are in when they sign a contract with Chris Blackwell for two albums. And the first album is called Catch a Fire. They recorded it in three weeks. Blackwell gave them 8,000 pounds, which in those days was the weekly cocaine budget for Eric Clapton. And they produced an eternal masterpiece. The album flopped at first. It only sold 15,000 copies, although it got great reviews. And then they came back to England in the winter of 1973, 72, 73, to record the second album, Burning. And when they weren't in the studio, they were doing one night stands all over the coldest parts of Britain. And Blackwell told them that he would absorb all the costs of the tour. At the end of the tour, when they delivered the album, Blackwell gave them a bill for 42,000 pounds, which he said they owed him. And a check each for 100 pounds expenses. Bunny quit the group on the spot. He said, I'm no longer going to trade one part of white man's Babylon for another. Peter lasted about six more months. They did a fall tour in which Joe Higgs, their teacher, replaced Bunny Whaler. Joe was not paid for that tour. He talks about it in the book. He had to pretend to be a madman to get Bob to even listen to him. 
It's one of the sadder stories in here. So at the end of 1973, Peter Tosh quit the group too, and Bob didn't know what to do. So he began auditioning some women to sing back up to him, and three of the finest female vocalists in Jamaica came together, Marcia Griffiths, Judy Mowat, and Bob's wife, Rita. And they were going to call themselves We Three, but Judy said, wait, I and I are Rasta. It must be the I Three, not the I Threes, <laughs> although some of their records say I Threes, but the real name is the I Three. And they gave Bob a whole different sound, and Bob went on that year, 74, to record a magnificent militant masterpiece called Natty Dread, in which he sang, I feel like bombing a church now that I know the preacher is lying. Who's going to stay at home when the freedom fighters are fighting? And it became a breakthrough hit in England. And Bob, in 1975, came to America as a solo artist, played a succession of rapturously received shows at the Roxy in Los Angeles, and all the big stars came out. And in fact, um, last month I emceed the Whalers Band show, uh, recreating the 1976 concert that was released as an album uh, on the same stage where they had performed 41 years earlier. And before the show in 1975, Bob called the band to the dressing room and said, Bob Dylan's in the audience tonight. Anybody strikes a wrong note, you're fired. And that picture you saw earlier of Bob with, uh, with George Harrison was taken that night. And uh, when Bob met him in the dressing room, he called him Ross Beetle. <laughs> so that was a breakthrough tour, especially for the Lyceum concert in England that year, which was released as a live album and produced a, a million-selling single of No Woman, No Cry. So by that point, in England, at least, Bob was a huge star. In 1976, he had his only top 10 album ever in America called Rastaman Vibration. And by the end of 1976, he wanted to give something back to Jamaica. He hadn't played live there in a long time. There was a tremendous upheaval politically. Uh, in 1972, Michael Manley, a socialist, was elected prime minister. Uh, a lot of people left the country. There was a tremendous brain drain in Jamaica. And uh, there were going to be elections sometime around the end of 76, early 77. But Bob eschewed politics. He wrote, never make a politician grant you a favor. They will only want to control you forever. And he really felt that way. Although he did appear in campaign rallies in 1971 and 2 for Michael Manley, and Bunny said it was only because they paid us more money than anybody's ever paid us before, $150 a night, and we had nothing to do with politics. I think he's being ingenuous, but that's what Bunny said about that. So in, by the end of 1976, Bob wanted to give something back to Jamaica, and he wanted to do a, a free concert. But before he had a chance to plan it, signs that started appearing in Jamaica, uh, in Kingston, saying that Bob was going to do a free concert on the prime minister's grounds. And so Bob went to Michael Manley and said, you know, that's nothing I ever agreed to. And they talked about it. And finally, uh, the prime minister said, well, you can have Heroes Park Circle by the National Stadium, and it won't be a political event. And right after they announced that concert, Manley declared national elections to be held shortly after. So he co-opted Bob. And by appearing on the same stage as Marley that night, it would look as if Bob was endorsing his reelection. So Bob became the object of death threats almost immediately, particularly from the uh, right-wing Jamaican Labor Party. So he was placed under a guard called the Echo Squad day and night. The concert was scheduled for Sunday, December 5th. And on the night of Friday, December 3rd, seven or eight gunmen drove through the gate in the front of Bob's compound at 56 Hope Road, down the road from the Prime Minister's residence. The guards who had been with him day and night for weeks prior to that had all disappeared. Rita was driving out of the compound at that point and was shot in the head. The gunman raced through Bob Marley's yard, shooting everybody in sight. Bob was in the kitchen peeling a breadfruit. 
and the, his manager, Don Taylor, was on the left and Bob was on the right, and a gunman came in and fired five bullets into Don Taylor and turned around and shot Bob. The bullet came across his chest and lodged in his arm. If he'd been inhaling instead of exhaling, he might have been dead. It came that close to killing him. Nobody was ever caught. Um, there are several rumors. Um, and one of the persons who has been accused falsely for years of being involved in the assassination attempt was Carl Colby, whose father had been the head of the CIA. If any of you have read the Booker-winning novel Seven Killings, um, it takes all the rumors as if they were fact and tells a story. In fact, the, the, the character, the Colby character, is seen arriving five or six weeks before the concert and putting together a posse of people to come and kill Bob, which I think is a tremendous disservice. And nobody ever interviewed Carl Colby about that, uh, even though he's been accused in numerous books and magazine articles of being involved in this assassination attempt. Well, I found him in the <laughs> Beverly Hills phone book, gave him a ring, and he came over, and it was the anniversary of the shooting, in fact, the day he came. And I, I showed him one of the news the magazine articles, and he, he was appalled, you know. He arrived in Jamaica the night Bob was shot. I think he was on, on the way to the hotel that night. And uh, what I wanted to do with this book is to put that rumor to death and there are four chapters about the entire Smile Jamaica assassination attempt in there, including an eloquent statement from Mr. Colby about what really went on at that time. And he, he loved Bob Marley. And it, it just seems to me a terrible disservice that this, this stupid rumor continues. And I'm no fan of the CIA. And I would love to find solid proof that somehow the CIA was involved in that assassination attempt, but I've never been able to, to nail anything of the sort down. And uh, it's, it's too long to go into now, but that's where I stand on that. I think ultimately it was a gang of young gunmen from the Jamaican Labor Party who had heard that uh, Edward Siaga, the head of the party, didn't want the concert to go on and they took it upon themselves, uh, led by a, a gunman named Jim Brown, one of the chief gunmen for the JLP. And uh, that's what happened that night. Uh, following the assassination attempt, Bob went into exile in England. And he was living there with a woman named Cindy Breakspear, with whom he had fallen in love. She was Miss World at the time. She's Damien Marley's mother, Junior Gong. And uh, they spent just about all of 1977 together, mostly in England. And Bob was recovering from his wounds and making two albums at once, uh, Exodus, Time Magazine's album of the century, and Kaya. And in June of 19, now I'm jumping ahead, uh, 77, he makes those two albums, and he begins what was going to be the biggest reggae tour in history. And at the beginning of the tour, he was in France playing soccer against a team of French music journalists, and one of them had steel spikes on his shoes and accidentally stepped on Bob's big toe on his right foot, pierced the shoe, and eventually tests were done and they discovered that Bob Marley had melanoma cancer, which had already reached the third stage when it was discovered. Now, you can't give someone melanoma. There's not a doctor on earth that would tell you you can give someone melanoma, but that rumor persists to the, this day. People, some people say that the CIA paid the journalist to put poison on his spike and step on Bob. People be really believe that. Um, so Bob had to cancel the rest of the tour after the European leg and spent the rest of that year recovering. Um, in 1978, well, go back now to the elections that were held right after the Smile Jamaica assassination attempt. Michael Manley won overwhelmingly. And for some reason, he decided to put two of the chief opposing gunmen in prison. 
Bucky Marshall and Claudie Mossop. And he put them in the same cell. Maybe he thought they'd beat each other to death, I don't know. But they began comparing notes and they realized that they were being played for suckers by the powers that be. And they declared a truce between themselves and another man in the cell went back to Western Kingston and spread the word that they had arranged this truce and a spontaneous peace movement broke out. And at the end of the year, they were both released from prison and they went to England to beg Bob Marley to return to headline a concert cementing the truce named after one of Bob's most famous songs, One Love. And Bob was very suspicious because he knew at least one of the people had been involved in the assassination attempt. But eventually he agreed to come back at the end of February and prepared for the concert to be held on April 21st, which was the 12th anniversary of Haile Selassie's visit to Jamaica and the night of a full moon. And at the end of that eight hour concert, Bob called the two leading figures of his land, Edward Siaga and Michael Manley, to come on stage and shake hands in front of 40,000 people. Show the people that you love them right, he sang. Show the people that you're gonna unite. And he held their hands aloft in a benediction to Rastafari, a moment that his art director, Neville Garrick, compared to Christ on the cross between the two thieves. And two months later, the United Nations honored that move with the United Nations Medal for Peace on behalf of 500 million Africans. It was arranged by Mamadou Johnny Seka, who was the youth ambassador from Senegal to the UN, who himself would also die at 36 from melanoma, just as Bob. And it was a, a major moment in Bob's life, and kind of surprising to me that in the Marley film, they never even included that or even told people about it. Bob went back to Jamaica. He had built a studio at 56 Hope Road called Tough Gone. And whenever Bob was in Jamaica, lines of people would come from the entrance to the house all the way out through the yard into the street begging money from Bob for various reasons. And according to Colin Leslie, who was another witness in my book, and had to sign the checks or they weren't valid. So this guy, more than anyone, knows where Bob's money went. Colin says Bob Marley supported 6,000 people a month. 6,000 people a month depended on Bob Marley's charity for their very lives. He never had a house of his own. He bought dozens of houses for other people, baby mothers, band members, relatives. He didn't even have a real bed until about 18 months before he died when some of the women in his life got together and bought him a bed. He was just as happy sleeping on the ground with that rock stone for his pillow. And if you asked Bob right to the end of his life what he was, he would say, I'm a farmer. I'm a farmer. So native peoples, indigenous peoples all over the world relate to Bob in ways that a lot of us can't because Bob was in tune with the rhythms of nature. He understood that. And it, it was something that was crucially important for him to tell the rest of the world about. He loved Africa. He wrote a song in 79 on the survival album called Zimbabwe. Actually, he didn't write the song. It was written by a man who was living an expatriate Jamaican named uh, Flippins who had moved to Shashamani to an area of Ethiopia that His Majesty had given to repatriating Rasta. And he recorded that on his survival album, which is the other militant masterpiece along with Natty Dread. Only now Bob's philosophy had matured. It was no longer the eye for the eye because that just makes everybody blind. He understood that if you're going to change the world, you must change yourself and you must change yourself according to the one love philosophy. And that was what he took to the grave with him. And uh, he was able to visit Ethiopia in uh, 78, terribly disappointed by what he saw after the Derg had overthrown Selassie. In the beginning of 1980, he went to Gabon and shortly after to Zimbabwe and I, uh, <laughs> I toured with him for two weeks at the end of 79 on that survival tour. 
And I recently uh, was approached by uh, some people involved with his horn player, a man named Glenn DaCosta, who uh, toured as part of the horn section in 79 and 80 with Bob. And there's something that uh, hadn't been known earlier that I'd like to share with you. Um, this is about uh, when Bob was touring in late 79 and he played the Apollo. Glenn DaCosta said, and then there was the matter of Bob's special jug, which remains mysterious to me to this day. Dave Madden and myself, as hornsmen, were always close buddies and we'd share whatever we could whenever, food, whatever. And we got in late for a show and decided to raid the whaler's fridge. So I had some orange juice, but David went for the more, shall we say, exciting drink. It was Bob's jug of whatever it was. I don't know, something he took to get on stage, a blended drink especially prepared for Bob. David had a glass full of Bob's drink and immediately realized it had a very negative effect on him. <laughs> on stage, David is always the most responsible and focused musician all the time, and he's a big, big guy, big muscular guy. He's very thorough and he does a good job, so when he was feeling the effects of the drink and told me, Glenn, I, if I'm making any mistakes, tell me, I was truly shocked. I couldn't believe what was happening. Then, as we were playing, I realized that he was leaning on me. <laughs> Apparently, he couldn't stand on his own feet then. And then I had to switch parts right there because he was playing very mildly instead. The boldness had gone out from his instrument. After the show, that was at one of the early shows at the legendary Apollo Theater in Harlem. We had two shows that day, as uh, we would normally take a half hour break and come back to do the next show. That day, we had to stay for over two hours because we had to lift David off the stage and we had to revive him with some very sweet sugar water. He laid flat on his back like a boxer that had just been knocked out. I'll never forget it. It's always a laugh when we remember it. David learned his lesson and never touched Bob's juice again. For Bob, it was okay, he could take it. I don't know what was in that jug, but I'm sure that some powerful ganja was there or maybe some other mixture of some other drugs. I'm not into drugs, so I wouldn't know, but for it to have that kind of effect on David, it must have been some really special stuff. <laughs> um, beginning of 1980, Bob is invited by the family of the president of Gabon, Bongo, to come there to play a concert for his daughter's birthday. And among the many stories, the haves that have never been told, is a tale of what happened really on the Gabon trip because the whalers were thrown out of the country unceremoniously. And that is an amazing story. Um, the next trip was to Zimbabwe, and I wasn't there, but an extraordinary woman named Dira Tompkins was. She's a, an activist and a, a philosopher and uh, one, one of the, the really important people in Bob's life, and she told me the inside story of what happened in Zimbabwe, and she's here with us tonight. And would you stand up and let people say hello to you, Dira, please? Mm -hmm. It, it is an amazing tale of what went on. And, and after Bob played that night, um, nobody knew what to do with him. He didn't have any formal host. They jumped in a truck driven by a guy who didn't know how to drive a stick shift truck. They went up and down the streets trying to figure out where they were staying. And uh, when they finally got together uh, and the I-3 uh, saw Bob, uh, Bob looked at them and said, now we know who are the real revolutionaries, <laughs> which is a line from the Zimbabwe song. So if you want to know what really went on in Zimbabwe, Deera's testimony in here is crucial. Um, the end of 1980 is a sad story. Bob played all over the world in 79 and 80, and his dearest wish in life was for, one of the dearest wishes, was for the black American audience to accept him. And there was virtually no black press on him. Uh, many black stations never played a note of Bob Marley's music till the day he died. And he, uh, 
he wanted to tour in the end of 80 with, with uh, Stevie Wonder. And in fact, he did a couple of shows with uh, the Commodores. And those were at Madison Square Garden, the third and second shows from the end of his career. And he collapsed the following day after the two Madison Square Garden shows when he was jogging in Central Park. And he decided, well, they took him to the hospital and found out that uh, he probably had three or four weeks left to live, according to the doctors. Instead of checking into the hospital, he flew to Pittsburgh to do one last show, and that's been released as a live recording, and you would not know anything was wrong with Bob if you listened to that recording. He ended up being treated for his cancer by a man who is often referred to as a Nazi doctor named Joseph Issels. Well, you'll learn about that in the book, too, because his wife tells the, the true story. Yes, he was a Nazi. When he became a doctor uh, around 1933, he went to work for a Catholic hospital in Germany. And the heads of the Catholic hospital told him that he should join the SS for career advancement. So he did. And in 1938, the SS told him he could no longer treat Jewish patients. So he quit. And they drafted him, and they put him in the front lines of World War II, and he eventually got captured and spent the remainder of the war in a Russian prisoner of war camp. So that's a little different story from what's been told out there. He was able to keep Bob alive until May of 1981, when Bob passed away. He got back home as far as Miami, and he died in the hospital in Miami on the morning of May 11th. At that point, the same time in Kingston, Judy Moat told me that a bolt of lightning came through her living room window and lodged on the metal frame of a picture of Bob Marley. A signal, she said, that one of the Earth's great spirits had transcended to the celestial plane. His funeral was the biggest in the history of the Caribbean. It seemed most of the country showed up for the cortege from Kingston back through the center of the country up to Nine Mile, where he was laid to rest. And I think a lot of people felt that that was the end of Bob Marley, especially the politicians. The irony is uh, Edward Siaga was now the prime minister and ended up delivering the eulogy at Bob Marley's funeral, the man whose people came to kill Bob Marley. I think they thought they were rid of him. Bob said, Reggae music will just get bigger and bigger and bigger until it reaches all its rightful people. He might as well have been talking about himself because today he is recognized as the most important musical artist of the 20th century. In fact, it's not just me who feels that way, but the New York Times. In the millennium, the New York Times said that Bob Marley was the most influential musician of the second half of the 20th century. The first half, they said, was Louis Armstrong. Both of them, daily herb smokers. <laughs> Go figure. In 1994, Bob Marley was inducted as the first third world member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. There's only one other since then, that's Jimmy Cliff. In 2001, Bob was awarded the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award and got a star on Hollywood Boulevard. At the millennium, the BBC did 24 hours round the world coverage as each time zone came into the new century. And at the beginning of each of those hours, in each of these different countries, people began by singing One Love, which became the anthem of the millennium. The New York Times built a time capsule at the millennium, and they wanted to put one work of musical art in there to signify the most significant musical moment of the 20th century, to be opened a thousand years from now if there's anything left. Uh, and what they decided to put in there was the film of Bob Marley at the Rainbow in London in 1977, which I think is really remarkable. Um, Amnesty International, I, I mentioned earlier that the, the head of it says that Bob Marley is uh, the symbol of freedom throughout the world. Uh, 
the charity we've talked about. At one point, a man came to Bob Marley one day with an idea to start a company dealing with coconut oil, and Bob wrote him a big check right on the spot. And his business manager, Colin Leslie, said, Bob, what did you do that for? And Bob said, oh, I've always wanted to be in the oil business. <laughs> Hazrat Inayat Khan was introduced to me by my friend Sharon Jarbo in a book called The Mysticism of Sound and Music. And Hazrat said, music raises the soul of man even higher than the so-called external form of religion. That is why in ancient times, the greatest prophets were great musicians. He also said, there will come a day when music and its philosophy will become the religion of humanity. If there remains any magic, it is music. The music, the use of music for spiritual attainment and healing of the soul, which was prevalent in ancient times, is not found to the same extent now. Music has been made a pastime, the means of forgetting God instead of realizing God. It is the use one makes of things which constitutes their fault or their virtue. Music, he wrote, is man's nature. It has come from vibrations and he himself is vibration. There is nothing in this world that can help one spiritually more than music. And Bob Marley was the greatest musician of our time, and it's been my honor tonight to share his story with you. In 1996, the New York Times Sunday Magazine celebrated its 20th, or its 100th anniversary of publication. And they asked each of their critics to choose one work of art from the 20th century that they felt sure would last at least 100 years into the future. And John Pirelli's, the eloquent chief pop critic of the New York Times, wrote, Bob Marley became the voice of third world pain and resistance, the sufferer in the concrete jungle who would not be denied forever. Outsiders everywhere heard his voice as their own. If he could make himself heard, so could they, without compromise. In 2096, when the former third world has overcome, overrun, and colonized the former superpowers, Bob Marley will be commemorated as a saint. Thank you. And now it's time for questions and answers, and Ms. McLean has the microphone for anybody who'd we'll like to ask. All right, we have maybe just time for a few questions, and we want to have a book signing, too, uh, before you guys slip away, so maybe three or four questions. Questions. Now, the time in Delaware was strictly to earn money so he could start his own record label, so he never did any performing there at all. He basically lived in the basement of his mother's house, grew some herb in her backyard. <laughs> and he actually made jewelry to sell at Woodstock. He had two friends, and oh, here's another important point. He had two friends, Ibis Pitts and Dion Wilson, and I've interviewed both of them. And uh, Ibis had a little kind of African arts and crafts store across uh, from Mrs. Booker's house, Bob's mother's house. And uh, Bob, the night before Woodstock started, sp stayed up all night making hippie jewelry out of rocks and little precious stones and beaded wires. And that was taken by Ibis to Woodstock, who sold everything out. But Bob and Ibis and Dion were speaking one day in 69. And Ibis said, oh, you know, you're going to be a big star. You're going to have a long life. You're going to have all these kids, and everybody's going to know your work. And Bob said, no. Mm -mm. When I'm 36, I'm going to die. He was 24 at the time he said that. And of course, that came all too sadly true. So that explains, I think, the intensity of those final years of his life once he knew he had the cancer, why he never stopped, never let him slow, slow him down. Um, he knew 
somewhere he knew. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You felt the, can you talk to us about his first appearance at Madison Square Garden and how he dealt with the rejection that he got at the hands of uh, Sly Stone? Oh, well, that's two different eras. I think his first Madison Square Garden show was 76, if I'm not mistaken. And he played there in 78 and 79 as well. But the Sly Stone thing was interesting. When, when the Whalers first uh, toured America in uh, 1973, in the fall, uh, Joe Higgs was replacing uh, Bunny Whaler, who had quit the group earlier. So it was Peter Tosh, Bob Marley, and Joe Higgs as the Whalers. And, you know, Bob never bothered with stage costumes or anything fancy. He looked like he just walked off an assembly line half the time. And he was opening, uh, it was the opening act on a national tour for Sly and the Family Stone, which was the e essence of glam rock and all of that stuff, fur coats and jewelry and everything. And so the audience in the five shows that Bob ended up doing with Sly was just baffled. They couldn't understand the patois. The rhythm was something they were not familiar with at all. And uh, they just bombed. All the stories that they blew Sly off the stage are absolute false, absolutely false. They, they were let go because they were just not connecting and they were left on the side of the road in Las Vegas with their suitcases. And a disc jockey from San Francisco named Tom Donahue brought them to San Francisco and uh, got them some local shows in a club owned by one of the Jefferson Airplane. And they did a live uh, uh, concert uh, at uh, a studio in Sausalito that was later broadcast and uh, released as an album, which is really, really great stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, the Madison Square Garden shows were so huge and uh, I think he made the most of them and, and made an awful lot of new fans there too. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, one second, one second. For recording. So I happened to see some footage on YouTube of Dick Gregory and Bob Marley together. A mandala? Where, where he was speaking on Bob's financial uh, mismanagement. What was their relationship like? Because I, I rarely see those two together. I know he just recently passed. Yeah, I, in fact, I gave uh, him a copy of the video of that, that concert uh, years ago. Um, I talked to him about that. Um, Bob's manager, Don Taylor, uh, deserves a book of his own. He wrote a book of his own. Uh, it's largely fiction. Um, <laughs> he, he had, you know, in later years, he claimed he threw himself in front of the gunman to, to save Bob Marley's life. Well, it was total bull. He was over here. Bob was over there. He didn't have time to think. In fact, if, uh, the following year, he did a, a television interview in New Zealand where he talked about just that very fact. No, I didn't have time to think. The guy turned around and shot me five times in the groin. And I, I fell down. Bob was over on the other side. So the book tells a different story, and there's no, there's no truth to, to the story that he thrust himself in front of Bob to do this heroic act. Uh, it's very hard to accept most of what Don Taylor said. He set up a travel agency with his wife so that they co could collect all the uh, profits from Bob Marley's tour tickets, airline tickets. Um, and Bob caught him red-handed uh, taking money in Gabon uh, and not giving it to Bob. Yeah, so there, there's a lot of stories in there, yeah. Other questions? Comments? Rude remarks? You have a comment? Thank you. I'm, I'm from New Jersey. And we'll we'll are, forgive you. And there are, yes, well, uh, there are people from New Jersey who are even just small-time gangsters. And um, uh, I was with a small-time gangster, Pucci. Pucci? And, uh, Pucci. And uh, his, uh, he had a friend that was connected with some parts of Bob's music. I, I don't San, know the whole... San Juan music. Yes. So, but he didn't know anything about Bob Marley. He says to me, he goes, Bob Marley, who's Bob Marley? Is he black? I said, yeah, he's black. And he goes, well, who is he? I said, well, I can tell you this. He outdrew the Pope in Rome. He's pretty important. And he went, oh, and that's my comment. Well, he also told you, didn't he, that, that he owned Bob Marley? 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was a very strange, tattooed, weird person that said he lived in Sedona. Mm. Yeah. Well, uh, it, it is true that uh, you see a lot of the most bootlegged Marley material is the Lee Perry sessions, and they are accredited to San Juan Music, which was a mafia company. Yes. And uh, Danny Sims, Johnny Nash's partner, uh, he actually was the first person to ever give royalties to the Whalers for the Lee Perry material 25 years later wow. when he asked Bruno Bloom and Paris and me to assemble all of the music between the end of the Coxon period in 66 and the beginning of the Island period in 72. And he claimed he had the rights and contracts for all of that stuff, the local stuff on Tough Gong and Wailing Solem. And uh, when I was putting those series together with Bruno, I asked Danny one night if he could get me something, and he says, I could get you anything, I'm a mobster. <laughs> so one of, one of the things that the Daily News, when they reviewed my book, did a two-page spread on the weekend uh, that was headlined, you know, Mafia were Bob Marley's security at Madison Square Garden. Well, they were. They were. There were death threats against Bob in 1980 when he played the garden. And all of the security for the show, and uh, allegedly for the rest of the tour that never happened, was going to be mafia hitmen. Yeah, so. But I don't think Bob was directly involved with, with any mobsters. But look, he grew up in Trenchtown. Half the people there were mobsters just because they wanted to survive and feed their children. If they knew you were from Trenchtown, they wouldn't hire you. So you had no recourse um, in a lot of cases. So, yeah, that's true. Thanks, thanks a lot for that. I'm from Jersey too, so. <laughs> it's funny, nobody in Jersey says Joyzy. No. No. <laughs> One more question or comment. Why haven't you said to show you later when you... Um... Say again? I was saying I have a keepsake to show you later um, because I still have my ticket stub for when I saw him in 1978 here, mm. uh, actually in Maryland. At, at Landover Cap Center? Yeah, at the Capitol Center. In May. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, that's a good, good note I, to... I told you I'm a freak, man. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we want to thank you, Roger, for uh, another extraordinary evening, and really it was wonderful to hear everything that you had to say. I want to say that this will eventually be online. You can find this lecture online. It takes a few weeks for maybe months uh, for us to edit it, but you can access it. So thousands of people will eventually hear the lecture. Thank you for coming. And, and if you want to uh, check out the book sales, please just step outside. We have them waiting for you. And before I end, I do want to acknowledge the presence of one of the most extraordinary people in Jamaican music history, Dermot Hussey. You hear him on XM, on the joint, Channel 42, the reggae channel. He is one of the participants in the book, and he's sitting there with Deera Tompkins. And we've got Mr. Colby with us, too. So three of the major voices in the book are here tonight. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, Ms. McLean, for making this happen so much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.